Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation, brought to you by Jags, the leader in high-performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to jags.com for everything you need to fix your vehicles up. Well, my next guest is somebody that I started racing with in NASCAR. He got the best of me because he is better than me. He went further than me, but I love him to death because I think about him all the time. The great Jeff Burton. Jeff, how are you doing, my friend? I'm good, Hearn. How are you? Everything good? Yeah, my, my hair is getting a little long. I need to get a haircut. My hairs. <laughs> hey, man, you're proud of them hairs. You, you're right. You got to be proud of those hairs. Well, you have a nice surrounding there, a nice background. Where are you talking to us from today? Yes, yeah, so I got, you know, when, when uh, this room was, uh, when, when Paige and Harrison were in this house, this was kind of their room. Uh, this is where all their crap was. In other words, you know how kids are, right? They got, especially my kids, for some reason, they have way more, too much crap. So this was their playroom. And when they got out of the house, I turned it into my room. And so it's, I've got an office and now I have an office and uh, it's where I do these kind of things. And, and I, and it's also where, um, you know, Kelman and I need some separation from time to time. I can come up here and I got a big screen television. I can watch races, do whatever, sleep, take a nap, you know, kind of get away. So you're telling me this is your man cave. This is my, this is it's kind of a shame that this man cave because it's not a keg or anything in here. It's kind yeah. of a little too formal, but yeah, this is my man cave. So um, I guess she has her horses and you, you have your deal. Uh, People say to me all the time, how do you and your wife, another Kim, my Kim, they ask how we get along. I said, well, that's simple. I go up to the race shop. She goes downstairs and she has crafts. And at night we meet in bed. Now, every once in a while, I drive along some of the back roads there in North Carolina. I will see your wife professionally uh, messing with those horses. Is, that's yeah. a pretty big deal, huh? Yeah, it is a big deal. She, we, we, you know, we live right around the corner from where I used to live. And, and, uh, we, years ago we found this piece of property. It was a blessing and it's amazing that it was here and we found it. And so, and then the second blessing was the property next to us had a, uh, the gentleman that owned it had a prize bull mm. and he kept his, he built a barn for his bull. And so, we rented it for a while with Kelman's horses and then Kelman decided she wanted to try to turn it into a, uh, make a business out of it. So we ended up acquiring that piece of property, which is right next door to this one where we live. And so I got the house in the middle and on that side of it is, is the barn and the, the paddocks and the riding ring and all that stuff. And on that side of it is my shop. So we go out of the garage, we go out of the driveway. She hangs a left, I hang a right. And we go to our perspective areas right and yeah. then we meet here at night and uh and she spent they work I mean, it's crazy you think racing people are nuts equestrian people are nuts i mean because it is the work is unbelievable it never stops it's 24 7 you don't just walk out of the door and turn the lights off because horse is sick you got a horse that's having a problem i mean they're up there all hours of the night in some cases it is wild how much work they do but they love it and uh they're, they're trying to make a business out of it. They're doing pretty, they're not quite there yet, but they're working. I mean, the hours they work is crazy. And uh, it's, it's fun to see them have a passion for something. Well, we're, we're definitely going to get to you. And I think we're going to have a wonderful conversation. But you mentioned that that room you're in used to be Paige and Harrison. Uh, now, is Paige riding? Uh, is she still riding? And, of course, Harrison's a NASCAR cup driver. Yeah, so the, the, all the horse stuff started with with uh, my wife rode a little bit when she was young, but not much. But my all the horse stuff started with my daughter, and then my my wife followed it. So mm. my daughter works up there. Uh, she's she's learning how she's very good with the animals and very good, and she's learning how to, to manage the you know the, the people and and how to do that. Ultimately, she'll run it all. Uh, she's really close to doing it now. Uh, it's an amazing talent with with. Uh, with uh the animals i tell everybody my wife my daughter went to college for, sent my daughter to private school for 12 years and then a private college for four years and she works in a barn and, you know, and uh you know she came to me she's like dad you know I, i'm not really happy working in an office i really would like to and I, i'm like look you're talking to a guy that drove a race cars for a living and 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 
and melted metal together for a living. Like you, you, if, if that's what you want to do and that makes you happy, do it. I mean, cause life's too short to be miserable. And so she absolutely, she loves it. Uh, she's able to apply the business stuff that she learned in, in school up there. Uh, but, but it's no different than racing Kenny. And you know, as well as I do, the people mm -hmm. that will get up in the morning and don't have to look at the clock. Don't look at the clock when it's night, you know, when to come home. It's just a passion. That's what it takes to be successful with that. It, it's, it's so much like racing. It's crazy. Do you find in some strange way that it, has it given you something to do uh, your wife's side of life or, I mean, is it like, okay, honey, I'm all in with you. Or do you find yourself running off to Harrison or NBC? Uh, sounds to me like you've kind of taken a liking to the horses or not. Well, uh, that's their thing. I mean, look, I yeah. support it. Cause I, you know, cause you know, if, look, they, if, if, if uh, I don't care what, if they want to do it and they put effort into it the way they put effort into it, I don't care what it is. I support it. And, and you know, you've known Kim forever. She, she is a, you know, she is a worker. She is, you know, I think people, you know, people don't recognize, you know, they think that they see her on pit box on Sunday and they think she's into glamor and fashion. She's into cowboy boots and, and I mean, she's a worker. She just works. And, uh, it's in, and, and, you know, my daughter's the same way. So they're blue collar kind of people and, and, and they just work. They like to work and, and they, but that's their thing. I don't get into the horses. I don't get into it. I will not sit on something that weighs 1200 pounds and has a brain that big. Right. I, I won't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> well, my mama would say dynamite comes in small packages. And I think Kim is dynamite. Uh, <laughs> you, you and I, you and I race. Yeah. That was kind of funny, right? <laughs> well, you and I raced together. And, uh, in my early days, uh, I would see Kim on the pit box, maybe under the caution flag. I'd look in there and I'd see her cheering you on. So I really admire you and your wife and your family, because I feel like, you know, my wife, Kim, and, you know, we kind of mirrored each other, you know, where our wives were really getting us started. Hell, we, I mean, yep. you and I back in the Bush Grand National days, we were just starting out. Well, all right. And uh, enough of them. It, it's about you right now, my friend. Uh, nicknames are awesome because you have the Intimidator, Earnhardt. Uh, of course, they nicknamed Rusty Rubberhead because he, he, <laughs> he wrecked and kept on going. Uh, but nicknames are awesome. I'm the Herminator, and you are the mayor. But I think your nickname is one of the most respectful nicknames in all of sports. Uh, the mayor, when do you remember the sport giving you that nickname? When do you remember the first time you came up for air and went, what the hell? Tell me. Yeah, about I remember it like it was yesterday. Clint Boyer did that to me. <laughs> did he? Mass. Yeah, he, he's, man, he's messed up a lot of stuff for me. Um, <laughs> he's hangovers, a few long, few long days after hanging out with him. Um we, we had, a, we did a, we were at, a, I think we we're at California Speedway and it was my whatever rate. I don't remember the number. It was X amount of races, NASCAR races. I had won and a run and there was, you know, a little ceremony or something for me. And, and, and Clint was there. He was my teammate at the time. And, and he, he popped that on me and, and in front of the media, you know, and he, and he, and it stuck. Like, you know, we threw it against the wall and it hadn't come down since. And uh, that's where it started. Uh, you know, he, he, he gave that to me. Well, I agree with it because I was always very impressed. You're, you're very analytical. And uh, when the media would come to you, you had all the right answers. I mean, I, I felt like you were 30 going on 60. You had a good business sense. Um, with that being said, I remember a great quote. Uh, by Jack Roush, and you drove for Jack forever. And I, I kind of think that he was bragging on you. I remember Jack saying, uh, Jeff wants my job. I'm just not ready to give it up yet. <laughs> you remember that, I can tell. <laughs> so well, I don't know what that was all about. Was, was he, and, and I took it as you're smart and you can run the team right now. Do you remember that time? 
I, I, <laughs> I do. Uh, one, one of the fondest memories. I, look, the thing I loved about Jack Roush is he was a hard, he's a hard man. And, and he, he wasn't brought up easily. He got everything he earned. He earned everything that he has rather. And, and, you know, he, it's amazing what he built. It is absolutely amazing what he started with and what he built at Roush Industries and Roush Racing. It's 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 an American success story. Yeah. And and the thing that I always respect about Jack so much is that when he hired me, he he said he said, uh, "Look, I'm, I'm talking to Buddy Parrott about being a crew chief." Like, and he, how do you feel about that? I'm like, "Yeah, you damn right." Because at the very least, we're gonna have a great time. I mean, at the very least, with Buddy, we're gonna we're gonna have fun racing. And so when he when we started that team in '96. He made it ours. He made it so that uh, he, the only thing he said was, you know, you, you're going to get your transmissions and rear ends from from uh, from Liberty, where where the where the the six and the sixteen were. You are going to get engines from from Livonia, Michigan, Roush Roush engines. Other than that, it's your it's you guys do it. Do it the way you want to do it. Hmm. You cannot do it in conjunction with Liberty. You have to do it on your own. That was the orders, and and he let us run that race team, hire who we wanted to hire, build the race cars how we wanted to build them, without question. He gave us how many we could build. We had a budget for sure. We had a budget, but he let us do it, and and he charged us with doing that. And and he and he he would get out of your way and let you do it. When you screwed up, he was there to help you the first time. The second time, he was there to punish you. Right, mm-hmm. and. And it taught me, I became a man working for Jack Roush. He, I mean, it just was an amazing experience. And it went so far that uh, there were times he and I would butt heads. We would really go at it. And and one time he he walked me out of the front of the shop, right next to Rusty's shop, Penske, right there in Mooresville, right? Yeah. He walked me out of the front of the shop and he he walked it, he walked us into the you know, on the sidewalk and he pointed to the sign in front of the building. He said, what does that sign say? And I said, it says Roush Racing. And he said, yes, it does. It does not say Jeff Burton Racing. It says Roush Racing. Mm-hmm. And as long as it says Roush Racing, we're going to, I'm the final say. But the point in that was that he let it be, I felt like it was Jeff Burton Racing. And and I would fight him and push him and he would, and he would finally get to the point where, okay, enough, we're doing it my way. But he would give me the opportunity to argue, to to disagree, and so yeah, there was a while I did I did want his job, and uh, he was he was I was he was smart enough to give me enough rope to to let me run, and then he would rein me in, and it was just an amazing experience. So I remember those days. Frankie Stoddard was your crew chief, yeah, and you and you two. We're glued together. You were winning everything. Uh, you've got 21 NASCAR Cup wins, 254 top tens. Now, we're going to get to your stats later, but I'm sitting here looking at this. And to me, listening to you right now, Jack says, okay, you you and Frankie run the team, and you giving that many wins – you would have to think that it would, you felt pretty comfortable because you're, you're getting the job done. So when, when, when you did go head to head with him, you had to feel comfortable because you you had to feel like you were delivering. You were the man because you were delivering. Well, so a couple things happened and Kenny, you know how it is, man. You, you evolve right over time. You evolve and you change. And what happened to me early in my career was I let people, some people run over me. Uh, I let some people that I drove for run over me and, and I was the guy that was going to make everybody happy and, and was going to not cause trouble. And that Mediator. wasn't working out. Yeah. You know, that, that was, that was going to get me fired. And a matter of fact, it did get me fired. I got fired several times mm. and I got fired for things that for lack of performance in which the only thing I was doing was sitting in the seat and driving it. And, and, the shit wouldn't drive like it wouldn't, you know, it, or it might've for somebody else, but I couldn't make it. And right. so, you know, I let some people run over me, um, not just with decisions, but with other things as well. And I finally said enough, you know, enough. If we're going to, if I'm going to have success or failure, at least I'm going to have some say in it. 
and it, it got to the point where um, it was kind of do or die in my career. And, and, you know, things aligned. Don't, I don't want to make it sound like it was some grand plan because it wasn't. Things worked out when they looked like they weren't going to multiple times. And, but I just got to the point where, you know, to hell with this, to hell with being told what I'm going to do all the time and not having to say, I understand you're my boss. I get it. You're my boss. Got to work for you, but I'm going to try to have a say and try to help direct what it is that I think I'm good at or, and, and stay the hell out of the things that I think I'm not good at. But it, that evolved over time. And then Jack, when I got to Jack, it just all unleashed because mm. he was willing to let me do that. And I was in a place in my life where I was, I was ready to do it. And, and it had enough of doing it the other way, uh, which ultimately, by the way, was the end of my career as well, you know, because things changed so quickly that I wasn't smart enough to, you know, I, I, I how am I going to sit in a room with four engineers and tell them they're wrong? Cause yeah. they, you know, like it just evolved. And so, uh, that was my success, but it was also that ultimately my undoing as well. I, um, uh, man, the, these Kenny conversations really helped me mentally because my wife said to me all the time, you, you, you say yes, you need to learn to say no. Your team's running over you. You built your own cars, honey. You know what to do. Why don't you do it? And I felt just like you. I felt like if I bucked the system, you know, I wished I could have been a little bit more like my brother because, you know, he was he ran, you know, he ran Penske racing. But um, and hey, look, and that's that's where that that's Rusty, Mark, you know, those guys, like they were my heroes because they knew what shocks were in the car. They knew what springs were in the car. When I looked up and recognize I had to beat them mm. <laughs> like I didn't even as weird as it sounds like Earnhardt was on a different stratus like he was out there and that's nothing against Rusty and Fart because they're oh. but but they were the guys that I needed to beat and when I looked at how they were conducting their business it was they were in it they were making decisions they were they knew what was in the car. They knew how the bodies were hung. They knew they were in it. And, and that's what you needed to do. In my opinion, at that time in our sport, that's, that's where the success was. And, and look, I Rusty Wild, your brother, your brother at Dover, I couldn't qualify, I couldn't qualify to save my ass. I was horrible qualifying. And I was fitting next to him in the garage at Dover. And I said, Rusty, I, what am I doing wrong? I, I, why can't I drive this thing? And he said, well, let me see what you got. And, you know, we used to have our, we used to have our setups on a sheet of paper. Like it wasn't yeah. a, you know, and I said, he said, you gonna qualify that? I said, that's my intention. And he, he said, uh, he said, well, that, you're not going to qualify well. And he set my car up in the floor of the garage in, in the garage at Dover. He said, put this, 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 this in it, put this nose weight in it. Wrote it all down. I gave it to my guys. We put it in. I mean, that's how it used to be. Yeah. And and I still call it my bad. But but it 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 those were the people that I was had this super high respect for because Rusty was in there. You know, I pitted next to him. I saw his. I saw the way he interacted with his team. I saw which is why when when I got a chance to work with Buddy Buddy Parrot, I'm like, hell oh, yeah because I knew Buddy was all, he was going to be good with me being heavily involved. And so that's, you know, that's the guys that I looked up to and still look up to because they're the ones that, you know, they just didn't sit in the race car and, and mash the gas. They had something to do with the vehicle itself. Yeah. So, so a comment and then a question, uh, you and I grew up in an era, era where the driver had to take care of his own chassis. Uh, Rusty used to joke with me if if I started the race and I got 30 laps into it and, and I got real loose, he said, well, Herman, it's your fault because you are you were the last one to drive it. Smart ass statement, but he, he was right. So what you're saying is we grew up in an era where you looked over here and here was Mark Martin, you know, and, and here was Rusty. They were setting their own cars up and you felt like, hell, if I'm going to 
keep up with them. I got to have a lot to do with my chassis too. So that's my comment. My, my question is this, when did you feel that era changing to where there was so much, you know, coil binding the right front, we're pulling the nose down. I, I know all this stuff. I'm just wanting you to answer it. When did that happen? When did you find that happen? And how did you deal with that? So, so, um, well, it was the, it was the, it was what ended the, the Frank Stoddard, Jeff Burden relationship. It was yeah. because that was evolving. Uh, look, I remember we, we were at Richmond testing and Daryl Walter walked by me and he said, uh, three fives and a seven or something like that. <laughs> left front right front left rear what the hell are you talking right and then yeah. and then uh steve park won rockingham you know cool bound and and um how are you gonna make this work like what does this mean and i i i it 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 completely changed um we completely changed the way understanding that that arrow and center of gravity. We always knew center of gravity mattered, but we did that by building the car. We didn't do that by setting the car up, right? Yeah, get the lead low. <laughs> yeah, so now you're maximizing. Now you're maximizing center of gravity and and arrow with not just how you hang the body and not how you build the chassis and the parts you built on it, but how the car is ultimately set up. It changed everything for me. It changed everything, and and. Um, I, I vividly remember Daryl Walter walking by me and saying that, and I chased him down like, what the hell are you talking about? And, and, and then when Steve Park won Rockingham, uh, you know, coal bound, um, that was all the rumor and, but it turned out to be true. And, and then it started this, this game about when well, I game, it started this, this massive effort on how do you get there? And it, it was a, it was a major change in the way the sport worked. And, and the cars got really low in the front. And then the rules changed. We had a ride height rule. And here we are to this day. And, you know, I really liked what you said. I just learned a little bit. I would say the sport really changed what you're saying right now because we we had to uh, rebuild the race cars. Okay, now we're going to run them super low. So now we got too much angle and too much camber gain in the right front. And now they're – rebuilding the a-frame purchase so you do bring up a good point everything's bottoming out everything you know like to hell with testing let's just stay at home and we'll just keep raising stuff up so it doesn't hit the racetrack i mean that you know what i mean like yeah. you, know, you you had chassis sitting in the floor that no longer work because the frame rails are dragging the, I, mean, <laughs> I mean it it and that, that started this whole set of rules right and so when 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 fans or people say well it needs to go back like it used to be well it can't yeah it's impossible. You yeah. cannot put it back like it used to be because the genie's out of the bottle. Yeah. It isn't that the rules change. It's that, that we got smarter. We did it. Yes, yeah. we did it. And so, or they did it. I wasn't smart enough to do it. And, and so you can't, if, if you had a, if, you know, the cars need to be back like they used to be. If yeah. you brought Midnight and whatever them damn race cars names were, whatever they were back and you brought them back and put them on the racetrack, we would screw it up. Yeah. Like you can't build enough rules to make it so you, we wouldn't screw it up. So the, 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 the genie's out of the bottle. Everybody's a lot smarter. Uh, engineering and understanding of aerodynamics. All that is, is, it is what it is. It's, I hear it in dirt racing. Mm. I hear it in dirt racing. I got aero tight. I get behind another car. It's hard to pass. It happens in Martinsville. It happens in late mile races. I, it happens all over the country now because we we're learning and have learned how to maximize grip and how to, I mean, it's, you, you're never going to change it. It's not going to go back. I, I, I got to apologize to the fans tuning in here to listen to you because I can remember Matt Kenseth uh, saying to me, I'm looking for mechanical grip. When I'm behind somebody, I still want my car to, to turn. And I went, Oh, that's interesting. And I remember when that coming in. So, when you're behind somebody, you got no air to your nose. And that's when we were, you know, running a 900 in the right front and whatever it was. But good, good point, Jeff. You, you reminded me and, and everybody out there. That was the pivotal point when the sport changed was the nickname was three fives and a seven. A, five, <laughs> a pair of 500s in the front, 500 left <laughs> Good stuff. Well, listen, 
it's time for me, and we do this every Kenny conversation, and it seems like a really good time because you are you are very good. You're you're great, and uh, I enjoy this time at Kenny conversation. This is where I put my glasses on. No. Uh, Two hundred, by the way. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Hey, you want to read? You want to read with me? How great you are! <laughs> okay, um, Jeff Burton, right now, looking good at fifty-six years old. He's the mayor. Uh, one of NASCAR's seventy-five greatest drivers. Uh, now, Jeff, I'm going to read a lot more, but I want to comment on that. There's thousands of NASCAR race car drivers thousands and you have been chosen as one of the 75 best greatest um 695 nascar races over 22 years now feel free to correct me if any of this is wrong oh, i wouldn't know <laughs> yeah, well, come on now those i wouldn't know would. 21 nascar cup wins 254 top tens Damn, that's getting it, man. Uh, 27 Xfinity wins, 153 top tens. Uh, you made four truck starts. That's a story right there. Um, but we're going to wind it down right here because I feel like this, this tells everybody how great you are and why you were chosen one of NASCAR's 75 greatest drivers. You are a two-time winner of our granddaddy, one of our races, which is the Coca-Cola 600. You won it in 1999 and 2001. And then I'm sure you're going to agree this is the one you really liked. Uh, in 1999, you won the Southern 500, the lady in black, too tough to tame. So I say the same thing to all the racers. When I read those stats off to you, where's your mind go? What do you think about Oh man, that's, yeah, honestly, Kenny, it's I'm you know, um, I was really, I was really fortunate, because um, I didn't really have a lot of bush level success, right? Mm -hmm. I won a bunch of late mile races, but I didn't, I didn't win a lot of bush grand national races in the um, early going. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won them later, and and, um, I got. I got some opportunities that uh, just fell my way and, and uh, multiple times I thought my career was over and I'm talking about late in the year and things happened and I ended up, ended up in a car, ended up driving and, um, and ex, ex, you know, what I feel like I did a really good job was on executing on opportunities. Right. And, 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 um, like those top tens, I mean, that's, you know me, Kenny, that's really what I was about, right? Like I, I wasn't as fast as Rusty. I wasn't as fast as Mark. Uh, those guys have elite, you know, Jeff Gordon. Uh, those guys had a, have elite speed. I wasn't, I wasn't that. Uh, I would worry the hell out of you, you know, for 500 miles. I mean, that was what my strength was. And, and so I feel like I got, I feel like I got a lot out of my career um, with less talent than Mark and Rusty and, and some of those guys. I was not as good as they were. I, I, I honestly, Mark will say he wasn't as good as anybody. He's full of shit. I really wasn't. And, and uh, they just had more, they had more elite speed than I did. Uh, so I'm really proud of what I did. Cause I felt like mm -hmm. I ground, I ground out a career and, 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 and did it kind of with a blue collar, a blue collar mentality. I'm going to go a different direction here because this is just what's in my mind. Uh, I'm not a journalist. Um, we do Kenny conversation because it's fun. And it was a friend of mine's idea. And I'm like, okay. And then we're having fun doing it. But I don't remember you ever saying you were retiring from NASCAR. Was, was there an event or did you ever say, <laughs> did you ever say I'm retiring? Because no. I just, I don't remember it. No, I, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I, I, I drove, I, I wanted, I, I wanted to run one more year full time is what I really wanted to do. And, and it just didn't work out. It was the right time to leave. It was the right time for me. It was the right time for Richard. I was driving for Richard Childress at the time, whom I have a ton of respect for. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, he had Ryan Newman was, was ready to come in and, 
Mm. And Ryan was, you know, ready to roll. And I felt like that team was, was in a good spot. And I had an opportunity with NBC. It just all, it all worked out. And right. then uh, I did run some races for, for Michael Waldrop. I was, was hired by Michael to come in as kind of a consultant to, to help that team. Um, and, and, uh, and then I wrote, I drove some races when, uh, for Tony, when Tony, Tony had a problem, I drove some, drove some races for him. But no, I never really officially retired. I kind of faded away. Uh, there, there was, which was fine, you know. Like it, it. I wasn't real sure I was wanting to be done, uh, and and I wasn't sure I was wanting to be done until I was fully done for like a year, you know. Mm. And I recognized I'm not as good as I need to be. Um, I, I didn't know. I don't know why. You know, that's a weird. It's weird, Kenny. Like I don't I have no idea why I couldn't be successful in my last two years of racing. It wasn't desire. It wasn't effort. It wasn't, I don't, I just wasn't getting it done. And I was fighting and believed I could and was working my guts out and bringing every bit of effort I knew, but the results just weren't there. And, and uh, I have no idea why. Well, Jeff, he, here we go again, because on Kenny conversation, I've been lucky, very lucky and humble to interview, have conversations with the greats. I'm talking you know, all of them. And and we are all the same. We are so damn hard on ourselves. Here, I just read off these stats that, hell, I would cut maybe three of my fingers off that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all the greats go back to those times that just weren't so great. Uh, why do we do that? Well, I mean, look, you and I, you and I, I, I watched you work. I, I watched you when you were driving for your brother you were intimately involved with that race team. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't this thing that you would come in and there was a race at seven o'clock and you would show up at five and you would qualify and race at seven. It was, it was. I was driving the truck and trailer in to yes. rock him. <laughs> yes. It was commitment. It was dedication. Yeah. It was all, it was your entire being. Yeah. And look, our wives and I've told my kids, I've been straight up with them. Y'all came second. It, it, I'm sorry. I mean, if you, if that yeah. hurts your feelings, you need to understand that that it's not that I didn't love you, but at the end of the day, I had my Kim was Kim was the one that get, made you guys number one. She allowed me mm. to make let you be number two. And by the way, she was number two. And racing came first, and and our wives knew it. They yeah. knew it. They might not want to admit it, but they knew it. Mm. It had to come first. Yeah. And and. You know, you and I were, were, were good race car drivers, but we were successful because we had a damn high work ethic. Yes. And that's how it had to be. And so when you, when you work, even today, the way you, the way you run your, your dirt races, mm. right? You don't just show up and drive, mm. you know, you do it all myself. Yes. And so, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's who you are. Yeah. So when it's who you are, you, you can't walk away from the bad times. You can't just say, ah, oh, shit. Mm, good point. Like it's part of you. And, and, yeah. And, and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Bad That's times exactly. were devastating. Right. So they like, people, rained. Uh, people, you know, God, it must have been fun racing. Hell no, it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. Fun is not the right word. It was intense. It was exhilarating. It was nauseating at times. It was terrifying. It was grat. It was, all of these things, but fun wasn't in the list. And, and, and so it wasn't fun because you knew those, those moments were coming and you knew that if you didn't work every, if you didn't make it number one, like now I can lay on this couch and take a nap. Yeah. When in 1998, do you oh. think I was laying on that couch taking a you nap? You were worried to death, breaking out in hives, <laughs> running to the shop. There's <laughs> no way. <laughs> so, you know, that reminds me, uh, you know, I admire you. Uh, back then, I wanted to outrun you, uh, and I couldn't. But later on in life, you said a quote, and, and I, it just reminded me when I was listening to you intently, and I wrote it down here, and I love this quote. And you, I want to know if you remember this. Somebody said to you about youth. And you looked at them and you said, would I want to be 22 years old again? And you said, hell no. Mm -mm. When we look back at ourselves, it was brutal, wasn't it? Yeah. 
It was, <laughs> look, I, 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 um, I, I've said it multiple times. I, my career almost came to an end several times. And one year, I mean, I never, I woke up, I woke up with a broken back one time, wrecked a late model car, broke my back mm. and knocked me out. And I woke, I was awake, but I wasn't really conscious until. What track was this? Tell me a little bit about Orange, Orange County. I, I just busted my ass in, in, a, in, a, in a race car that I, that I helped build and a seat that I put in the car and seat belts that I put in the car and I did it wrong. And, and, um, oh, I, 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 uh, I had, I didn't have the belts running over a bar or anything. I just had them running over my shoulders. So when I hit it just, you know, it just compacted me and it crushed, crushed some vertebrae. Um, and I, I woke up, I woke up in the rescue squad going to the, the Durham hospital a race in Orange County and, uh, in a late model. And even then I, I wasn't, I never contemplated, well, I'm going to quit. Like it wasn't, it didn't even enter my mind. But one year, uh, my second full year of Xfinity, as my second, actually, I guess it was really my first full year, but second, second year of trying to run all the races, I got about three quarters of the way through. And Kenny, I was done. Like I was emotionally, physically done. Um, couldn't do anymore. Couldn't, I was exhausted. I was, you know, my Kim's dad is a, a physician. He wanted to put me in the hospital. And I, I couldn't, you know what I mean? I can't, I can't do that. I got to keep going. And that was the only year that I'm like, is this really worth it? You know, like, is it really, is it really worth it? And, and, uh, but I got, I got through it, but man, those it, it, people just don't, they just don't understand how hard it is. They see the, if you're racing on Sunday or on Saturday on television, they see that they had, you know, no idea. Yeah. what went on before you got to the racetrack and and it is it is a uh it, it's a great way to make a living i just bragged i didn't brag but i was just told a story about you know my horses my horse farm and you know i mean without right. racing i don't have any of that stuff but but it was every bit of it was earned i can promise you that okay so i listen to you intently and i do my best to write notes down uh, I stress over what I'm going to say, <laughs> but you told me just now something that I thought about. Is it fair? Do, do, do I remember this right? Were you the first NASCAR driver to ever have a full containment seat at Daytona? I remember yeah. you coming into Daytona, the July race with all of us looking at your car and you had this crazy contraption in there. And now that I look back at it, I'm thinking to myself, was he the first one to have a full containment seat? Yeah. Tell so me it was, that. it was the, it, so, so we had four, I was driving for Ford and they had had a seminar, a safety seminar. Remember we, we had several, Adam, Adam got killed. Uh, Tony Roper got killed. Kenny Irwin Jr. got killed. Yeah. Um, you know, we had these, these horrible deaths and for, and, and it just wasn't right. I mean, we, and, and, you know, racers, I was, you know, just shrug it off. Right. It was, it wasn't to be shrugged it's off. dangerous. Don't do nothing. So, so, um, so Ford, and I don't remember the timing. So, but I don't remember the timing of it, but Ford had a safety seminar and, and, um, um, had this conversation about how IndyCar seats are different than the NASCAR type seats. And, um, and I started looking at pictures about, yeah. you know, their heads were contained at that time. And you know, why can't we do that? And so prior to that, we had done the, uh, remember Simpson built the Burton net, you know, it was a net that went down the side. Oh my God. Yes. Right? I forgot about that. Nets on both sides of yeah, us. Yeah. So, well, it started on the left. Because um, a Jerry Nadeau had a situation, and there had been talk about it, and I think even you may have been in a situation in New Hampshire where did the driver's helmet make contact with the wall? Did that happen? Mine did. Yeah. And 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 it. I mean, it hurt you badly. It hurt Jerry Nadeau obviously very badly. And so it how? My career, but go ahead. I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bad deal. So, you know, we, so we built this net, um, uh, 
me and Rambo that, that um, worked at Roush, we built this left side net and uh, we went to Simpson and said, we made them up a pattern and said, can you build us this? And they, they liked it and they put it, they actually made it in a catalog, put it in their catalog and they called it the burden net. Mm. Then we, then we put it on the right side like how to contain, you know, try to contain your head, right? And then, then they were like, wait a minute, why can't we do this with something more rigid? So we, we, and, and at that, that time, it, the, it had gotten ramped up. Um, uh, Cal Wells had gone, he was trying to build a carbon seat, the first NASCAR carbon seat, full containment. He was off on that project. Uh, that was taking forever to get done. I mean, forever. And I said, the hell with this, we're, we're no need to wait around. So Brian Butler, I went to Brian Butler and I'm like, man, we got to, we got to figure this out. And so we built this head containment and it had a, it had a hole in the side of it where you could look through, you know, <laughs> got to see who's next to me. Yeah, I mean, we didn't know, right. And, and so, yep. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, that was, uh, cause we had, I didn't, but the sport had started building uh, containment with, with catch rather than catching your ribs, catching your shoulders. Cause we were all breaking our ribs. Yeah. But but we did nothing to contain the head, and so in in the first time that the head was contained, fully contained was was yeah Daytona, uh, in in my car and a piece that Brian Butler and, and I had built together. Okay, well I want to make a big deal out of that right here right now. I just when I listened to you intently, my mind went back there. To me, you are an award winning innovator because. Race car drivers are, uh, we got egos. I ain't doing that. You know, I'm a man. And here you showed up with that and it made it okay. Uh, so I want to thank you for saving everybody's life. There's no telling how many drivers might have been killed or maimed. And here you did that. Uh, and I hope NASCAR listens to this. Uh, and I hope that, you know, sometimes things are delayed and, um, you did that. And this is like having a dream and waking up 10 years later going, I remember when that happened. <laughs> and that's what just happened to me just now. Um, okay, let's lighten the load. I feel like we've got a little too intense here. <laughs> Damn, I'm exhausted. Thanks. And I say it every time. <laughs> Things tend to happen like that around me for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, it's all good, though. It's all good. Um, earlier today, I said I'm going to talk to Jeff Burton and somebody had fun with it. And it's, it, listen, it's a good thing. Okay. Rusty Wallace, my big brother, Mike and me, we're all different. I am way different than my brothers. So we have Ward who is a great racer, a good human being, his son, Jeb, great marriage, but he is as country as they come. And so the, the joke was always that, Ward grew up on the south end of the house <laughs> and, and you always were okay with it. Why? Okay. So here's the question for all the fans drum roll. How come you are so straight spoken with zero country pumpkin accent? Why are you two so different? I have, uh, we, Hey, look, we did blood test. <laughs> we're brothers. Um, I, look, I one one when he was driving with Caterpillar, I, I somebody asked me that, and I said uh, he spent a lot of time in the woods, and the animals taught him how to speak, and, <laughs> and uh, they didn't think that was funny at all. They, funny. Were, they were not happy. I, old Greg with Caterpillar, he came to see me at the track. He's like, I don't think that's funny. <laughs> so, but everybody is. else thought it was. <laughs> uh, hell, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, and we have a middle brother, Brian. Okay, and I was going to ask about that. This is unbelievable. Tell me about this hidden brother. Yeah, so Brian Brian won more go-kart races than Ward and I did put together. I mean, Brian was a badass in a go-kart. and But he's a little more practical than we are. And uh, he, he did the go to college. He always knew what he wanted to do. He, he, my, my family had a construction company in it for forever. And my brother, for as long as I can remember, that was his goal. He wanted to take that thing over, and he has been running it for, you know, God, 30 years. But but uh, he's a third generation, and that's what he wanted to do. And he looked at this racing thing and said, you guys are nuts, you know. And, yeah, and, and you were. And we, yeah, we were. And, <laughs> and my parents thought I was nuts. Everybody did, right? And so, uh, so he 
he is in the middle of us. He has like he is dead in the middle of us in age, and he's dead in the middle of us in how he talks, how he looks. Uh, yeah, he is right in the middle. He has some of that, but not as much as not as little as me. And but I have no idea because no one else in our family has uh, that. I don't even know what you call it, the accent or whatever it is that Ward yeah. has. No one else has it. And, and, but he is, Ward is his pot. If I, when I, everywhere I, well, not everywhere, most places I go, people ask me, <laughs> where's Ward? How's he doing? What's going on? Ward, people loved Ward. Yeah. Okay. Cause he would tell, he would call it like he saw it. He, he, he just, he, he drove fearlessly. Yes, he did. Oh my God. He drove. I mean, you remember, uh, you remember, uh, Darlington in the Indiana pony sitting, <laughs> sitting on the phone at Darlington on that fresh pave and then coming back the next race. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to do it again. And he came off turn two and that thing. I mean, it turned around fast and, uh, but he was in the gas and that's how he drove. I mean, he, yeah. He was in the gas, and and I was more, you know, a little more calculative. I wasn't as in the gas. You feel it. Yeah. They, they said, uh, Ward, what happened to the MBNA MBN Pontiac? He said, well, it spun out and bust into flames. And, boy, it did. It caught on fire. So <laughs> he, I, he, we were at Pocono. We were the rookies <laughs> racing at Pocono. And, um, you know, he decided that somebody was holding him up or something. He was going to pass him on the outside over in three, right? Yeah. And, like, that's one groove, right? Yeah. He jumped up on the outside of it, and he firewalled deep that thing. And, oh. you know, and he gets out, and he, they interview him. He says, man, I just need a, I just need some experience around me to tell me not to do those things. <laughs> <laughs> My mom would say, self, why did I do that? So <laughs> So Brian, uh, the the brother that we never see, uh, you know, the inquisitive minds want to know. So, is he is he still as successful? Is he running the the family yeah. construction business or South yeah. Austin? Yeah, he's doing great. He's, he's done a, done a great job with that company. He's grown it. He's done a really good job with it. You remember when um, we used to run? We'd go to South Boston and run the run the bush races. Oh yeah, uh, the, the 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 grass three and four, all those people would sit up there and it was, Oh yeah. Whatever, I don't know. You know, they'd always have Burton signs or whatever. Well, that my brother, Brian, he was the ringleader of that whole, that whole thing. Uh, oh yeah. Massive supporter of, of Ward and I and now of Harrison and Jeb and just, just huge supporters of us. And, and he's, he's the, he's the uh, family patriarch. He's the guy that always does the right thing. Always is there to help, always there to support. He's the uh, he's the leader of the family. Well, that makes me really happy because uh, you know we are competitors, and sometimes we just don't calm the hell down and uh, realize <laughs> that there's somebody. Hey, I I had a friend one time. I, you know, he, I I grew up with him as a child, and uh, he, he he drove an over the road truck, and uh, he came to uh, Charlotte and parked his truck out. You know, he parked it somewhere anyway. I got him a pit pass. And he came down to me, you know, I'm getting ready to get in the car. I got him pit pass and everything. And he, and he was talking to me as we were still, you know, playing, you know, in the creeks and shooting BB guns. He says, this is really dangerous, Kenny. Be careful. And and I thought, this is so damn sweet because we're just so hardcore. He probably going to die. You know, he'll probably get broken <laughs> ribs. And here's my friend, like your brother, you know, <laughs> oh, really yeah. sure and worried about us. So, um. <laughs> Man, oh man, here we are again. Looks like you're gonna be over an hour, and I, I'm trying to hurry up here. But there's so much to you, so you know I have to talk about your son Harrison. Uh, he came on the scene just lighting it up on short tracks. I mean, winning the biggest races there was, and so that paved the way for him to make it to the big time. He he runs for the Wood Brothers right now uh, in the Cup Series. Tell me about your son, Harrison. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess you don't got to go in depth, but I know you, you and Kim love him so much. Uh, where is he at right now? And what do you think? Well, they're, you know, they have not had the, they've not had the success that they, they want to have and that they obviously need to have. And, and at the cup level, you know, getting here, 
he did, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, he, he, uh, he, he won everything he sat in and, right. and I mean, you know, at eight years old, he's running around the country winning, like he's won a lot of races, a lot of races and, and, uh, you know, K and N, Arca, you know, late models, quarter midgets, like he won a lot of stuff and, and did it. It was fast. Yeah. Like fast, smart, like this is the, you know, he's got the whole package and, and, yeah. He, then he went to uh, he went and and ran his first full year at KBM at, at Kyle's place, and they did he and, and Todd Gillen and they were they were both lighting up you know Arca K and N they were you know contending for the wins having incredible races racing against each other big rivals didn't really like each other enough now they're best friends um, didn't really like each other that much they go to KBM together and neither one of them is having success and 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 um, and you know, most people went to KBM, just lit it up. Right. And neither one of those guys were doing it for whatever reason. And that became public, you know, Kyle said some things publicly and, and, and that, that put a lot of pressure on those two young men, which ultimately was, was fine. Right. It, 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 it taught them, it taught them at a young age, Herm, younger than we had to learn things that you went through. Oh but... yeah. Oh yeah. And, and <laughs> it made them tougher, it made them stronger. And then, um, you know, so they got, to, he and Todd both, you know, got through that and, and it made them stronger and made them tougher. Uh, it was a great experience for them. They were driving really good equipment, but they weren't having the success that they needed to have for whatever reason. And, and when you're at a big team that's used to winning races and you're not, it's going to fall on your shoulders. Yeah. That's how it is. You know, that's just simply how it is. And so, um, so then the next year he went to, to, uh, to Gibbs and just had a great year rookie year you know won four races broke carl edwards uh record for for the best start in the in for a rookie driver in the xfinity series just you know lit that up and then and then went to cup and and it's it has not gone as well as anybody wants it to the wood brothers harrison uh the penske organization it, it just you know obviously hasn't had they haven't been as good as they need to be um, really with, with, with he and, and Cedric both, you know, both of those guys have struggled getting up to speed, uh, bringing consistent speed the way that, that their teammates have been able to. So it's, it is what it is. They, they've got to find a way uh, as a race team to be better. And Harrison's got to find a way for him to be better. And they collectively got to find a way to do it together. And, and um, the talent's there. It's you don't go, you don't, you don't lead the most laps of the snowball derby. You don't sit on the pole for the derby. You don't, done it all. yeah, you don't do all the things that he did has done, uh, to, and not have talent, you know, and, and, and however, it's, it is a different world. Yeah. And we talk a lot about, and lately the conversation, you know, has been about how much practice late model guys, asphalt late model guys get. Well, you know, Harrison and a generation of drivers grew up COVID mm. and it completely changed mm. Good how, point. think about it, like Harrison ran three Xfinity races at Gibbs full time, won the second or third race at California, not, you know, I might be wrong, the fifth race, I think the fifth race at Atlanta is the one that got canceled. The COVID mm. race got canceled. Mm. From that point on, no practice. Right. Hard on a young man. And 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 so he greatly benefited from practice. Like he he greatly benefited from lap time. And and um so they still matter for Christopher Bell, Christopher Bell, um uh Cole Custer that whole, those guys, they came to me several, you know, and they're like, we, we got to get practice. This is actually ruining our careers. Like we got to find a way. And, and, but we haven't, <laughs> we still yeah. really don't have practice. So, um, but it's that to me has, has hurt some young drivers and some it hasn't, but it has hurt some young drivers, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it has had an impact, but now going into the third, his third year in cup, um, 
there needs to be an uptick in performance. There's no question. And, and the team's made some changes. He's really happy about the changes they made. Um, but he gets along with everybody. You know what I mean? He hadn't, yeah. he hadn't become an ass just yet. You know what I mean? It'll happen. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, we, we don't, we really don't want him to go through what we went through, you know, well, belts because we qualified 20th. Or yeah, yeah. But you got, you have to, and, yeah. and there's no, there's, there's no way around it. You know, you have to, you know, I watch what he's gone through. I've watched what he's gone through and I paid attention to how he's handled it. And I'm really proud of how he has handled it because yeah. um, it's hard. Like you yeah. and I know, you and I know Incredible. what he's going through. Yes. Cause we've both done it. Right. And um, it's, it's actually pretty interesting. Somebody put up, somebody put on, uh, on uh, social media, Twitter X, whatever the hell it's called. Yeah. Um, my first year, my first two year stats compared to his first two years stats. Yeah. And it's pretty eerily similar. Mm. And it, it's an example of, and you know, Dale Jarrett reminds me of this all the time. If, if, if Dale Jarrett hadn't have been given enough time, he would not be a hall of famer. Mm. Remember yeah. he, ca he came into cup and was, and then got sent back out of cup and then came back into cup. Mark Martin too. Mark Martin. And so Dale Jarrett reminds me, he, he, Dale watches, Dale watches Harrison a lot. And, uh, and, and he's, he's, he tells me all the time, look, man, that kid can do it. He just needs time. He's doing a lot of things. Well, they just got to connect all the dots. And, and uh, fortunately the Wood brothers have, you know, they, they see his work ethic. They see his dedication. They see his desire uh, they all see that. And so, you know, they're like, Hey, we, this guy deserves another, you know, deserves a shot to make this happen. So, uh, you know, he's going to get a shot and they got, they got to go make some stuff happen. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. I think of all the drivers in this next gen car who have popped up and, you know, have had dry times and started winning. I, I expect, you know, him, him to be great. I really do just because I love racing and I watched how fast he was in every division he ran. I just wanted to hear what you had to say. I know how much you and Kim love your boy and your daughter. Um, so you said something just then that made me think. You said uh, Cole Custer, C. Bell, Christopher Bell came to you and said, we need more practice. Are you the Racing Alliance representative? Are, are you in charge of that? Do you talk to NASCAR on behalf of the NASCAR drivers? So, so the, the driver's advisory council, the DAC, I, I, you know, the drivers a couple of years ago, they've been trying for years, Kenny, to get a little more organized, a little more together. Uh, you know, I had, I had a few of them, five, six of them come to me and said, Would, can you try to make this work? Cause you're the mayor. They tried to do it and it just didn't happen. And and for one reason or another, it just it just couldn't make it, it just couldn't make it happen. So they came a few of them came to me and said, Can you try to make this happen? We need it. I believe the drivers need it. I believe that I believe the sport needs it. I think it's in the best interest of the sport. So uh I I, I said yes. Um, um I ran it by a few of my friends, a few of the people I respect, Kyle Petty. He thought it was a, he thought it was a, he's like, look, man, if, and remember this is pre uh, next gen car, mm. right. And there was a lot of conversation about the next gen car and safety, et cetera. And he's like, look, if this thing is from a safety standpoint, you know, like it could use your involvement. Like, so he was kind of the one that pushed me over the edge. And, and uh, so anyway, I spent a lot of time talking to people in the sport Um the people at the top of the sport, the people in all different areas of the sport. And, and there was a genuine desire to let's get the drivers more organized, uh, communicating better with NASCAR, communicating better with the entire industry. And so we got, we got the DAC up and running. Uh, we are in its, we're in its full, we're ending its full second year now um, with a great relationship. We've, we've done, we, we, we operate behind the scenes, Kenny. There's really yeah. no need for us to operate in front of the public because 
It's yeah. just not necessary. Does it need to be a show? No, it's not a show, and it's not, and it's not about, it's not about me. It's not about. We have a, we have a board of directors uh, that you know we have regular meetings. We got one this week in, in Nashville uh, on Thursday. We we regularly meet with NASCAR. We have quarterly meetings with them, formal quarterly meetings. But we 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 have you know through it we came you know, weekly drivers meetings are back. Uh, we're well, not not necessarily weekly, but but you know every two or three weeks the drivers and NASCAR get together to talk about things. Uh, we've just created a clear pathway of communicating, just a clear pathway of communicating, and, and through that came a lot of really cool things that the the that the fans have benefited from, and they don't even know about it, and it's fine. They don't nobody needs to know about it. And NASCAR has been a willing partner. Uh, the car owners have been a willing partner. Uh, the the industry of uh, the entire industry. Uh, so yeah, it's work. It's, it's working. We have a, we can be a lot better. We need to be a lot better. Uh, but, but we've in two years, we've come a long way. I mean, from where we were to where we are today is, 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 uh, completely different. Yeah. Well, I think it's fantastic. DAC drivers advisory council and boy, don't, didn't we need somebody back in our day to rep us and instead we get pissing matches and arguments and, (laughs) <laughs> yeah and you know look it, it's it's so so the the, the thing is that uh, what's really cool about this is that you recognize how much the drivers care about the quality of the race too yeah right you know and like what yeah. can what i mean there's a we, we're testing phoenix you know there's a, the short track test at phoenix and a lot of what's being tested and it got a lot of stuff got tested at richmond a lot of what's being tested is through, you know, over a year of conversation with NASCAR and the drivers about what it is they're dealing with, right? That if, if it was better, it wouldn't just make it more fun to be a better race car or be a race car driver. It would make a better race. Like, what is it that yeah. we can do that'll make a better race for the fans, right? And so there's a lot of things that are being tested uh, that I think will be implemented this coming year just to make short track racing and road course racing better. Um, you know, and, and it's from, it's from talking, it's from having blunt conversations that arguments, disagreements in an environment where it's okay to disagree. It's okay to argue. We're all on the same team here. We're all trying to make it better, but we're going to have different opinions. And we, those opinions, those different opinions should be celebrated. Not, I mean, or not ridiculed. They should be celebrated, but you have to have an environment in which you can do that. And, and, it's crazy, man. The drivers that that say the least, like if you listen to them, like great point. Well, that's a great point right there. You know, and so what what happened in the past, and you know this as well as I do, because your brother was one of them. Yeah. And and I watched, so I became one of them. They were in that trader, they were in that NASCAR trader every damn week. Giving their opinion. Every week. And I watched that and I said, I'm gonna do that too. And, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like I'm going to that damn trailer, and 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 because if I don't, no one's going to know what I think. Yeah, I want to be represented, and so that's where it was. I mean, hell, you remember we used to uh, on a rain delay, we used to we we we'd look to see if Earnhardt came out of the damn yeah yeah because he was always in there, walking, right? Like, <laughs> well, we're going to go ball. back and listen. <laughs> Earnhardt come out of the trailer. <laughs> you know, you bring up a good point. I don't want to belabor this. I like just the smoke say, coming out of the smokestack. With the, yeah. With the right. Oh, hey, I heard I heard plenty of conversations that Earnhardt controlled seventy five percent of the fan base. If you want NASCAR to fail, we'll just tell Earnhardt to say something bad, and, and that's <laughs> controversial right there. But you know what? Um, really, really, I I mean this loving. Uh, when you look at the history of NASCAR. You know, they hired NASCAR Cup crew chiefs, whether it was Gary Nelson. And now they got, you know, David Green and Chad Little. So sometimes, you know, maybe the sport wants to go, no, we don't need any racing people. But here, if you look at the inside workings of the NASCAR business model today, you got Chad Little, who's a a major player. Uh, You know, David Green's, you know, on pit road, checking safety or whatever job he's got now, but uh, Elton yeah. Sawyer, um, yeah. Oh my God, yeah. what do I think? Elton Sawyer, great. Me and you raced with him. Uh, Elton Sawyer, thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, Scott so, Miller. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of them. Yeah, so we we do make our case right there, and uh, you know, it, it benefits the sport, the business model, saying, hey, 
the drivers are saying this, so maybe we do this, it'd be a better race at Phoenix. Maybe they'll be able to get side by side or, yeah. So good, good stuff, Jeff. And, and thank you for being uh, the spokesperson for that. I don't think many people talk about it that much. Uh, good job there. So, okay, man, I get my butt chewed out if I don't ask you this question. Um, you are going your butt out? Myself. <laughs> There's three of me. <laughs> what are you doing? Can't you see I'm kicking my ass? <laughs> so Dale Earnhardt Jr. and you appear like you are two little brothers. You guys are locked at the hip. And I can see it from afar. It seems like you guys just have fun. You have your mic, your you're somewhere doing TV and you're in a corner, turn one or two somewhere. Tell me about your relationship with, with uh, Dale Jr. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, Kenny, like you're in the middle of the sport, but you don't, I didn't know anybody. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I guess I'm an ass. I didn't want to know anybody, you you're know, like, four. you know, it, it's, it's your competitor. Like it's, yeah. you know, we might go drink a beer or like, but, but so Post driving career, I've gotten to know people, right? So, Steve Letart, you know, I I I knew I was being hired, and I knew he was being hired. I walked up to him in the garage, and I man, I've maybe just spoke a hundred words to him my whole life, and I'm like, I hear we're working together in a few years, and he's like, hey, shut up, shut up, like I you know, <laughs> don't say nothing, right? So, so you know, and 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 he's become one of my dear friends, and Dale Jr. the same way, like like. I didn't really know those guys. And, and when, when Dale Jr. said, Hey, I want to do TV, you know, our bosses are like, Hey, we'd like to get him. And, you know, Steve and I put the full court press on, like we wanted him and, and, and we wanted him because he loves racing. Right. I didn't know. Well, he really I, does. I didn't know a damn thing about any of that. I just knew that he loved racing and he really wanted to do it. And, He's you know the biggest name in the sport, and like let's let's he's good. It's good for the sport to have him involved. Like let's do it, and so you know we 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 ended up getting it done, and and then you know now like oh crap, what do we do? Now we got this guy. What's he gonna do? You know, and he's come in and just works. I mean he he doesn't have to, you know he he he's Dale Junior. He do whatever he wants to do, and yeah. he comes in and he just he works hard. He prepares. He he's committed. And, and we messed around with, you know, how do we, how do we utilize him with us? What do we do? And, you know, we just, we, oh, through time, we ended up just putting he and I in a booth together mm. and, and it just, I don't know, it just works. And, works. and we have a good time. We just, we, it's, it's when I leave my house going to the racetrack, I don't have to do it. Yeah. I want to do it. It's yeah. fun. And, and, you know, we, we take it seriously, but at the same time, we have a good time. We have fun. It's watch it's, it's, we're not, we're not curing world hunger. Yeah. You well, know? well, you know, we had Dale Jr. on Kenny conversation and uh, the funniest thing he ever said, I talked to him about TV. He said, man, NBC had me go cover the, a horse race. I don't know shit about horses. <laughs> 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 no, I, it, it was lighthearted. So, oh, uh, yeah. We're coming to the end here. Uh, I ask every race car driver or people that are in the industry, and this is how we end Kenny conversation. And I always warn everybody, don't get yourself in trouble because Kenny conversation is is good. It, it, it's good for the sport. So uh, your opinion on NASCAR right now, NASCAR today. So, look, I, I, I have a I have a real inside view of it. You know, because of the, the driver's advisory council, you know, my kid drives a cup car. I'm involved. I, you know, I'm, I'm heavily involved. Obviously, I work with the, what I do with NBC. Like, you know, I, I have a super inside look at it. And I have tons of optimism about where this sport, the effort being put in to making this sport the best it's ever been. And we're, we're it. You're never going to, if somebody likes something the way it was, if somebody liked the NBA in the 80s, you're not going to make it the 80s, right? You're not going to do it. And, and, but 
in my eyes, if you look at our mile and a half racing, it's the best we've ever had. I mean, you okay. think about think about where we were, right? So we built all these mile and a half racetracks, and then we went, oh shit, what do we do? Like the racing is not good. Too many of them. So now the mile and a half racing is really, really good. And the short track racing has not been as good. So let's fix the short track racing. Like, let's don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like we got this part really good. Like this mile and a half stuff's really good. The super speedway racing is really good. How do we fix the short tracks? Right. And if we can do that, then we, the product on track is, is good, really good. And, and that part of it, that part of it, to me is the is the essence of the sport right is the is, is the on track performance we've got to build we got to have more household names yeah we got to have more people that know these race car drivers that's what we have to do we got to find a way in that and 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 yeah. You could put a hundred people in this in this room and talk about why we don't have more household names and you have a hundred different opinions. Right. And and it's a complicated thing. It's it's but but at the end of the day, we have to have more household names. These cup drivers, people have to know who they are, the way they knew the way they knew Rusty, the way they knew Mark, the way they knew Dale, the way they knew all these guys, right? They they, they were household names. And and that's what we got to get back to. And okay. and what that formula is is very difficult. And if somebody if somebody can tell you tell you exactly they know the way to fix it, they they maybe they think that, but it's there really is not one answer. You know, I, I tell people this all the time, you know, bell bottom jeans were badass for a while, man. I know you had a pair, right? They oh yeah. Cool, right? <laughs> Wear them anymore. Right. They, right. You know, it, you know it, it, I I think I think uh, oh Kyle Larson, I I hate to bring it up again, but, you know, I yelled this from the top of the mountains about two weeks ago. Kyle Larson won the cup championship, and I'm repeating myself right now, but it's it's worth doing because I don't know if you remember it. Uh, Kyle Larson said, Kyle Larson, you won the championship. How has this changed your life? He says, it hasn't done anything. No, nobody doesn't even know who I am. And I think, you know, what you just said makes me happy because I believe – you're inside the sport and it makes me happy that they know it and they're addressing it. Okay. Second thing out of three, your opinion on the new next gen car. We know this is a game changer. It's a complete different race car. What is your opinion on it? You know, I think it's given some, I think it's given some teams a chance that they wouldn't have had a chance otherwise. Um, You know, if you look at, you look at front row, if you look at what, uh, you know, what they did the last couple of years, uh, the resurgence of, of Roush, you know, I, I think that those things, the new car has been a big part of that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'd like to think that that will continue. Right. Um, it's, it, it, I understand why it's controversial. I understand why some people don't like it, but I do think long-term it, it's the sport had to have something change. You can't have this, you can't have these endless budgets that create this situation. You, Hey, if you want to see it, watch an F1 race on Sunday. And, and look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Some people love F1 racing. I particularly not that fond of it because it's not, it's not very competitive to watch. I think it's a, it's an art. It's, it's, it's amazing what they do. And I have a ton of respect for it. I prefer to watch a race that's closer. That's yeah. just me. And I think most NASCAR fans are that way. And I think that this car gives us long-term the better opportunity to have close racing and, 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 and you, man, it's an arms race. You, you were part of it. You, you know how it works. You know how yeah. it worked. It was an arms race. And, and that's not, in my opinion, that's not in the best interest. We used to have, this is what's so funny. Michael Walter said this years ago and he was a hundred percent right. You know, you had a Laughlin car, right. Or a Hopkins car. I used to go to Ronnie Hopkins shop to, to go pick up race cars when I drove the 99 car for, for, for Jack Roush. He was building our chassis. I went down there and worked with Ronnie. This is how I want my cars built. Rusty's cars were on the surface plate being built right there. I could walk right up to it. That's Rusty Wallace's car. It, it was the same as mine. Yeah. It had the same A-frames. It had the same spindles. It had the same steering box. It had that made you feel good. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. we went... When racing was its best, 
when we had the most popular NASCAR ever was, we had spec race cars more than what we had four years ago. Yeah. And people don't believe that, but it's true. I could walk in, I could look at Rusty's car, I and, and I could tell you by looking at the upper control arm how much Cambry had in the car. I could tell how much Castor he had it within a degree, right? Yeah. He, I, I mean, it, they were spec. We had the same truck arms. We had the same track bar. Like it, it. We had more spec cars then than we did five years ago. What, what was the setup at uh, the the joke? But it was so true. You pull into Charlotte, uh, 1914, 350, 400. <laughs> Nine and a half, ten and a half. Yeah, yeah. Nine track number. bar, track bar. <laughs> and so you know, forty nine percent wedge. Yeah, and fifty one and a half percent nose weight. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's good stuff. And, and, and you, you. You know, so you think about it, when our sport was the best it ever was. Good point. That's what it was. Good point. And so when people say, well, this new car, everybody got the same. We used to have the same. Everybody used to be the same. We, we, we changed that when we started building our own chassis. Yeah. We changed yeah. it. Yeah. It, it wasn't like that. And yeah. so, and so in my eyes, in my eyes, we're going back more to how it was when it was its most successful. We're not, we're not moving this way without understanding what happened in the past. If you don't understand history, your future is going to be screwed up. I said this last night, history. I, I didn't like history when I was a, when I was a kid, but if you understand it now, you, you need to write a book on connecting the dots. You, you have taught me, you have reminded me more today than I ever uh, have thought would happen because uh, the coil binding, the lower the front end and, 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 and the Hans, you know, the, the full containment seat. And you're dead on on this subject right there. Yeah. Okay. So uh, last but not least, uh, your opinion on how NASCAR is officiating the fines, which we have saw, woo, some big fines, penalties, how we're going through tech inspection today. So I, uh, so um, Emmanuel Zervakis. Oh, what a name. Um, <laughs> he what told me, he told me years ago, if you don't make someone do the right thing, they never will. Yeah. And, and. I believe that. I believe that in in motorsports, because there's so many things out there that you can touch. Tom Brady, the world went ape shit for how many weeks, how many months? Because Tom Brady might have overinflated a ball or whatever the hell he did. Imagine a, a race car. Imagine all of the parts that a race car has on it, in which you could do whatever it is that Tom Brady supposedly did with his football. Imagine that. Yeah. So if you don't have strict rules that are strictly enforced, it will get away from you. And yeah. and if 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 NASCAR police if NASCAR could put the genie back in the bottle from and and go back in time to 1997 and say, "Okay, you're going to run Ronnie Hopkins chassis or you're going to run Laughlin chassis. You can run this rear end or those truck arms, which is what we already had." Right. You're right. That's what would have been the right thing to do. But the only way to make any of that work is to have rules that are strictly enforced. Yeah. And if you don't hold people accountable, they won't do the right thing. Competitors will screw it up because yeah. we're, we don't care. We don't care about, about me. <laughs> yeah, so I don't care. Why do I care? I mean, people tell me that one of the worst races in the history was, was I led every lap in New Hampshire. I thought it was awesome. Yeah, like we'll do it again, and 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 but but you know, race fans didn't like that. I don't blame them. Maybe I wouldn't have liked it either. But hell, I didn't care. Why should I care? And so, so you have to have rules and you have to enforce them. Look, I think I think the uh, I think the fighting stuff is stupid. I don't I don't think that you know we don't need that crap. Two drivers want to get in each other's face and have a conversation. That's fine. But I I. I fighting and shoving and I, I just I, I we don't need that 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 I, I don't I just don't think it's necessary so yeah. I wish we'd put a stop to that and uh, yeah uh, but but I, I'm 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 a I'm a big penalty I'm a big penalty big fine guy I'm okay with it 
Well, listen, um, I've had a wonderful time talking to you. And I want to remind everybody right now that we are in podcast form. We're in podcast form. So you can listen to Jeff Burton on your way to work. You can listen to Jeff on the way home. Because, boy, there are sure is some good stuff right here. We are on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, Jeff Burton, my longtime friend. God, we were just children. And uh, <laughs> congratulations on all your success, you're as famous right now or you're as relative right now as you ever were. So thank you for being on Kenny Conversation. Thank you, Kenny. It's a good time as always. All right, everybody. Kenny Conversation just keeps on rolling. We have them lined up. And uh, holiday season is here. And the next one coming up, you don't know who it's going to be. It's going to be Max Pappas, Rico Abreu, Rick Mast. All right. Until next time, see you later, everyone.